Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. Thank you for coming this morning. Um, yeah, it'll be a little bit different today. Uh, typically, on a Tuesday morning here, uh, you'll usually find Todd and I right about here uh, during staff meeting. We uh, pray together for the week, and we talk about what is coming up, and uh, Carolyn joins us for prayer, and um, and then we begin to talk, and uh, some of our conversations are really, I think, quite interesting and stimulating, And um, but one of those that seems to continue to come up is uh, this paradox, this struggle between the grace of God that saves us and somehow our striving to walk with him. Is the Christian life a life of resting or is the Christian life a life of striving? And we talk back and forth about this quite often. You know, the Bible says it's by grace that you're saved through faith, not of yourselves, no works, nothing you can do. Uh, and yet it also says, Work out your salvation. It also says strive. It also says live up to your calling. So, so which one is it? You know, Jesus said, uh, come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Ah, oh, that feels good, doesn't it? And then he says, enter through the narrow gate, for narrow is the way and hard is the way that leads to eternal life. So which is it, Jesus? What are you talking about? Is the Christian life a life of effort or is the Christian life a life of rest? And so we talk about that. I'd like to read a passage that'll kind of get us going and then we'll have a bit of a conversation today. So it'll be a little bit different but this is what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3. He said, not that I have already obtained all of this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. That sounds like effort from the man who wrote, it is by grace that you have been saved. You know, you read passages in the Old Testament that say the horse is made ready for battle but it is the Lord who gives the victory. We ready ourselves. We get ready to fight, but ultimately God is sovereign. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, those who watch it, watch over it in vain. So you see, it's this paradox where it is by grace through faith and there's also a sense of effort. So which is it? And these are the conversations that we have. And, you know, Todd and I are just a little bit different, not only in body type, but also in personality. Uh, I'm given to a certain bent and he is given to a certain bent. And so we want to talk about that. Not that we're saying different things, but our backgrounds are really different. And so we kind of come to it a little bit different. And so we are going to have this conversation. And I have to confess, I'm more nervous about having this conversation than I ever am about preaching a sermon. It's so much easier. But I still brought notes just in case. So uh, there will be uh, plenty of information, I think, that we can go through. So what I think we will start with is just kind of talking about, you know, our backgrounds, the, what you're kind of bent towards and what I'm bent towards. And so um, if you'll kind of take over from there and talk about, you know, your, your history and, and how you view things. Sure. Uh, many of you know most of my background. And, um, but just a real, a real quick recap. Uh, I was raised in a Christian family. My, my dad became a pastor when I went to junior high. No, excuse me, when I went to high school. And um, so I've known this Christian thing for about my whole life. And um, when I, I was saved at the age of about seven or eight, and um, then from that point forward, 
I kind of assumed the Christian life basically was, okay, you're saved, you're going to go to heaven someday, and in the meantime, do your best to not sin. I, that's kind of what it felt like. It, it was, here, here are the things that Scripture tells you, that God tells you not to do, so don't do those things. And then here are the things that God says do, and so do those things, and then that pretty well is the Christian life. And so for most of my young adult life, uh, I, I was trying to live that out. Uh, some would call it behavior modification Christianity, basically. And um, it wasn't until uh, my divorce when I was 25 that I realized that actually is not the Christian life. It's not about being saved and then just doing good things. There's actually a lot more to it um, and a lot more freedom in the life in Christ that is offered. And so for the last 10 years, um, I've been walking in, in what I would call uh, the true gospel, which is that Christ has died and risen, and that when I receive and take faith in Christ, um, I am dead and risen with Him, and that my position has completely changed. In fact, all of who I am has completely changed. My life is now completely transformed, and I have a new identity. My spirit has been renewed. Um, the old man is dead, and the new man is here, and there is a new creation. And so, much of my life now is learning, relearning who I am in Christ and understanding more deeply who God is. Um, but up to that point of my divorce, it was all performance and striving and effort. And what are the things that I can do to make this thing work? And it wasn't until things came crashing down and it didn't work that I finally realized that there is something better, and um, that's when life changed for me. So that's the lens and the perspective that I have as I read Scripture and as I live life and as I father and, and, and am a husband and am a friend and am a pastor. That's the lens that I have and the way that I approach it. But your default setting... My default setting is to work hard at it <laughs> and to get it done. Right. And if something needs done, then do it. Mm -hmm. and, and I've admitted that many times to you all uh, <laughs> that I have a performance problem and that I have a control issue and that I don't trust God. And those are things that, that as a part of my sanctification process, like I am working through that and he is in the process, in the journey with me saying, hey, we see your sin. He, he sits next to me. That's your sin. Let's work on that together. Mm -hmm. let's, let's, let's do this together. And so there's an intimacy that I'm learning to grow in that still have a long ways to go in, yeah. uh, but that's exciting because it's a part of the process. Mm -hmm. And mine is different than that. I, am, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. Um, we went, you know, when it was convenient, maybe Christmas, maybe Easter, probably not. Um, and uh, I tried to be good. Um, I didn't really understand the gospel, but uh, I do remember... Um, well, let me back up a little bit even more. My, my, my personality is more to just, you know, relax. Enjoy the ride. Don't get so bent out of shape about certain things. I am not a type A personality. And so um, I have to be prodded a little bit. I am not you at all. Uh, I remember, you know, my dad being a little bit more like you was always busy doing something and I was always trying to get out of it. And um, I, I remember Saturday mornings, you know, I just... It would be a good day to sleep in, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be great to be able to do that? And um, 6.30 Saturday morning, there's a knock on my door. And my dad's saying, you're going to sleep all day? And my response was like, I would really like to if you don't mind. <laughs> but that never happened in our house. And so uh, I know inside of me there's this, can't we just chill out? Can't we just, you know, relax and rest? It's very easy for me to rest. But I feel guilty for resting, even though it's my, you know, what's inside of me. And even uh, my faith, you know, um, I do remember, uh, I think I've told you guys um, about being at our confirmation classes. It was a Lutheran church, and I hated school as it was. And so to have to go to more school and church kind of school did not sit well with me. And so I remember one time we actually skipped, or we skipped out on confirmation classes, and we sat in the sanctuary, me and this other guy, and we talked 
theology together. And um, he said something that I thought was brilliant. He said, you know what I think? I think when I die, God's going to take all my good works and he's going to put them over here and all my bad works and over here. And whichever one outweighs the other, that's going to be it. And I went, oh. <gasps> Brilliant! I love that because I was pretty good. I mean, I compared myself to my sister who was not good. I was. And so I thought, man, if that's how it is, then that's amazing. And so there's this thought inside of me that says I've got to be good. But then I heard the gospel. And the gospel says it's a free gift that God gives to us. There is no striving in that. There is no trying to be good. And so it was right in my wheelhouse, you know? Trust Christ, be saved, I'll do that. And so now there is inside of me this understanding of what the gospel is, but at the same time, now what? I tend to just sit back and say, all right, job done, mission complete. I can relax. And that's what I tend towards, whereas you don't. don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. so, so what we're, we're talking about here is, is it's the Christian life. And, and we've, our conversation so much is, is what you just said, now what? Mm -hmm. Like what, what happens mm -hmm. when we've, you know, we've crossed that line, we know that we're saved, Things have changed, but, but what does this life really look like? Because in Scripture, there, there are many places that are talking about new creation, um, that there is a new life that we have in Christ. Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Mm -hmm. And then we see the, the list of things to do. Mm -hmm. And um, what we're, uh, you know, it kind of seems like law. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, okay, I thought the law was gone, was dead and fulfilled by Christ. And yet you're telling me I'm supposed to do these things. So which is it? And I think that's the, the question that you and I have wrestled with. And as we both come to this conversation every time, it's, it's me saying, rest in knowing who you are in Christ. Mm -hmm. And it's you saying, yes. And there are things that go along with that. Mm -hmm. Like there is, a, yeah. there is an effort in that. Yeah. And so um, I guess as, as I think about these things, you know, I look, I, I think about Jesus. And it, John, John 1, um, this, so this is John 1, 3. It says, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And in him, in Jesus, was life, and that life was the light of men. So, so Jesus, he shines light on what, this life could be like. He has lived the perfect life. None of us have lived the perfect life. We will not live the perfect life. He's the only one that has and therefore has been able to cancel all of our sin. It's all gone. Right. Every single sin, past, present, future, crucified on that cross. Okay, so it's no longer here. And so if that's true, and I see Jesus as the model, it's not just that, and we've talked about this, that it's not Jesus over there yeah. that I'm trying to, I'm going to do this to get closer to him, this to get closer to him, so I can be like, I, I mean, all respect to the WWJD people, but <laughs> what would Jesus do? I think led us in a really behavior-centered Christianity. Yeah. Um, whereas my understanding, and, and again, it's kind of my bent in this, is I need to rest in trusting that my life is different now. Like there is, at the core of my being, I have been transformed. And so now I can, I don't have to do anything to please God. He's fully pleased in me because he sees me through Christ. Mm -hmm. So why do I have to do anything? <laughs> That's the question. Yeah, I... Well, there's a now and a not yet. You know, we, 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 the, uh, I know who I am in Christ. I am seated with Christ. But I'm seated right here with you. You're with Todd. I'm with you physically right here. But I know who I am. It goes to, to me, positional and practical. I will never be more loved. I will never be closer. I can never be condemned. 
All of those things are true. And yet there is a process of sanctification that is happening in my life. That I am being transformed from glory to glory. That I, I'm no longer the same person I was, but I'm also not the person that I hope to be somewhere down the line. I know that that is happening in me. That hopefully my affections are changing. That um, my desires are different, but that is a process. And I've noticed over the years that that does happen, that things that used to really get my attention, things that I really was fired up about, they just don't get my attention anymore. So what changed? How did, how did that happen for you? Well, I, again, I think, it's, I think it's a process, but I, if, if I could go to anything, for me, it's about my motivation. Um, Paul said this, he said, the love of Christ compels us. Because I understand what Jesus Christ has done for me, if I get that, if I really understand that, that he died on a cross for my sins, that he rescued me from the wrath of God, that he adopted me into his family, that I'm no longer a, a prisoner, that I've been set free, all of these things happened to me because of what he did for me. How can I not respond by absolutely giving my life to him? It's about motivation. It's, it's not about sensation. You know, it's not about I feel this and so I'm going to respond. And um, the one thing that I don't want to hear or don't want anybody to hear is that I, I want you to, that it's got to be this emotional thing. Um, I am an emotional guy. I, I emote when I worship, I raise my hands. Um, I get fired up about things probably more than other people do. When I preach, I do. I, I, I have to tell myself, would you just calm down? In my mind, calm down. Stop standing on your tiptoes and stop yelling at these people. And all those things just sort of, I just get into it. It's just who I am. And I realize that there are people that if they, were, if they had to do it the way that I did it, you know, there are people in this congregation, you worship with your hands in your pockets. <gasps> but you worship. It's not something that you have to do. So I don't want to hear this is the right way because this is what it is for me. But to me, it, it all goes back to my motivation. When I know, in that old song that Kim Hill sang, when I remember, you know, what he did for me, when I remember the nails, when I remember the cross, I can't help but worship him. There is a motivation there because I love him because I'm compelled by what he did for me. It is not about, you know, trying to please him as an act or a means to grace. That if I do these things, somehow I've done enough and God will be pleased. I am, ple he, I am pleasing to him. He is completely satisfied with who I am. And so um, I don't have to think of it as a religious exercise because I love him. There's some things that, you know, I don't have to be um, mandated to do. I don't have to be mandated to kiss my wife. I don't have to be mandated to eat pizza. I don't have to be mandated to take a nap. Do you know why? Because I love all of those things. There's no law there, is there? I love these things. And so I'm motivated to respond in a certain way. And because I know what Jesus did for me, it motivates me. It compels me. It holds me fast. It's not a drag. It's a joy. So you, you have gotten to a place, and, and I would say I have too, where we understand what Christ did for us. Mm -hmm. We understand that his, his, he loved us and his love, because he loved us for us, then we, we can love as well. Yeah, we love with the love of Christ. Right? Prevenient grace. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, so there, there is something that has already shifted in us. What about, you know, for the person who, who is saved, they've, they've come to a belief in Christ, but they just don't get it, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. in, in that they, not that they don't feel it or anything like that, but it just hasn't done anything. For me, it took that rock bottom experience in order to really be surrendered. Mm -hmm. Is that, do you think that's necessary? Or, or can, 
does it have to happen or not? Do you have to hit that rock bottom or what, what needs to happen? I hope not. Okay. I mean, it could be, yeah. but I hope not. I mean, that, that's, that's a little bit sad to me that you have to get there. It's okay if you have. I, I think it's before you hit rock bottom, you recognize all that. And the thing that concerns me with, with anybody, our congregation, our people is, I don't know that, I don't know what percentage of it is, how many want to care who want to be there. I think there are people that are completely satisfied with coming to church, you know, doing nothing beyond that. Um, I listened to a, a message by Andy Stanley. He was talking about James chapter one. And he said, um, you know, he said, be doers of the word and not just hearers only. And to paraphrase what he said, he said, you know, to be a hearer of the word is like somebody who gets up in the morning and he looks in the mirror and he sees what he sees in the mirror and then he walks away, forgets about what he saw and just goes on with his life. But the one who really gets grace, I think, is the one who stares at the mirror, the perfect law of liberty, the complete picture of who I am in Jesus, that he completed my salvation. And when I look at that, it still is revealing something to me. But the mirror only reveals, right? The mirror doesn't take care of the problem. I have to do something because the mirror has shown me something. I can't just look at the mirror, turn around and walk out and go to work or go to school without people looking funny at me. Every one of you this morning, you looked in the mirror, some of you maybe not as long as you should have, and, um, <laughs> and you, you had to do something with what you saw, right? You saw this and you knew that, oh, the hair needs to be combed, the teeth need to be brushed, the pimple needs to be popped and all that stuff. You knew something had to happen, so you did something about it because of what you saw in the mirror and there is this sense that when I see when I see again who I am in Christ what he's done for me it's not I, I'm not bummed out by that it is just this beautiful thought that I love him I love that he wants to transform me it's not just about showing up and feeling guilty you know I, I think there, there are times when you know we think that if I just listen to a sermon or if I just listen to a podcast or plug in Christian music, that somehow that's it. You know, we say amen or come up to me after church and say, man, you really stepped on my toes this morning. And I can't wait to come back and you can do it again next week. But my question I want to ask, which I don't because I'm nice, is okay. So what are you gonna do about that? What's the response to the spirit of God speaking to you? Is there anything that he's compelling you to do? Um, but it has to be compelled by love, not by, you know, the law. The law only reveals, you know, the problem, but uh, not, it doesn't take care of it. So we're looking in a new mirror, right? Absolutely. We're we're, we are reflecting Christ, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so out of 2 Corinthians 3, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And we who with unveiled faces, mm -hmm. this is the new mirror. Yeah, yeah. Unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory from glory to glory, mm -hmm. which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so my, and maybe the agreement here is that, not that we're arguing. No, 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 but, no, no. But the agreement is that one of the efforts is continuing to look in the right mirror. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, we have to know that when we look in the mirror, when we see the law of love, when we see the, the law of freedom in Christ, mm -hmm. that actually we look in that mirror and, when, and what is true, the most true thing about us is Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, Christ, that, Christ in, in us. Me. No longer I who live, Christ lives in me. So now Christ is the one that I look at. And if I look at him, I see me. Right? Yeah. Okay. So I see me and I can trust that that is who I am at the center. And so I don't have to do anything to try to make God more happy with me because he's already as pleased as mm -hmm. punch mm -hmm. with who I am. Mm -hmm. My effort and my work from that point, see, this is, and this is maybe where the big question comes in. So yes, I continue to look in that mirror. I want to stay in front of that mirror. I want to see Christ. Behold him all the time. Yeah. And then the now what? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what do I do with that? And so this, so James 1 talking about being mm -hmm. doers of the word, mm -hmm. 
that we are doing, there still is an effort in it. And I think the effort is in the abiding. The effort is in the staying connected and intimate with Christ Mm -hmm. because it is not our own strength that we live this Christian life. It is with the, the strength and the power and the um, all of Christ that is living that in and through us. Yeah. And I guess for those of us who are really big doers, you know, how do we... I, it, it would, it's really easy for me to go and say, okay, now I see that mirror, I see what Christ is like, and I'm going to be like that, and I'm going to do everything that I need to do. And that actually might look exactly the same as somebody who is abiding in Christ. That those two people are doing the exact same thing. They are reading their Bible, they are praying, they are doing good for others, they are living on mission, they are doing the exact same thing. But what you're saying is that the heart and the motive makes a huge difference in whether or not they're actually trying to, as a means of grace, or if it's just a response to the love of Christ. Now, here, here's where I think it gets a little dangerous. And I've heard you say this, that, there is, that my life is a token of appreciation to Jesus. My pushback to that is, does Jesus need me to thank him? Now, Hear me out here, because this is where you're like, oh, wait a second, this is heretical, watch out. But, and, and there, is, there is a thanksgiving mm-hmm. and a gratefulness that we always are living in. But if, if, if he needed me, why, why does he need me to continue to go to him and say, thank you, thank you? It's like me giving you a gift, and you say thank you, which is great. I'm glad you said thank you, and I, I want you to have this gift. I, it gives me all this great pleasure to give you this gift. And then the next time I see you, Todd, thank you so much for that gift. And the next time, hey, that was a great gift. I really appreciate Thank you so much for your gift. Like, sh- sh- stop. <laughs> Just accept the gift and, and enjoy yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, you know, yeah. so, so to me, part of the, the living out this whole token of appreciation kind of becomes annoying. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm not, I'm not yeah, saying that out of disrespect as much as just like, I, I, it seems to me like what Jesus said when he came was that he came to, that we could do nothing apart from him, right? He is the vine, we are the branches, that everything flows from him. Mm-hmm. And so we are simply conduits of him. And so the, the greatest effort for me is staying connected to Christ, mm-hmm. which is prayer and scripture reading and beholding Christ and thinking about him and worship music and, and all mm-hmm. types of different things. Um, I just, I guess, I don't know. I, that's, that's some of my struggle of, mm-hmm. you know, the whole responding with thanksgiving out of a duty, even though I know obedience is an important part of, of yeah. living the Christian life, too. Does that make sense? Yeah, you sound like C.S. Lewis, though, which is a great compliment, by the way. Thank you. Can I thank <laughs> he, you again? Yes, I'll thank you're you again. Welcome. No, thank that's you. it. He's, thank he, you. C.S. Thank Lewis, you. <laughs> before C.S. Lewis trusted Christ, he, he said, I feel like God is a, like a little old lady who always wants praise. And he's like, can't he get enough of that? And then when he trusted Christ and he understood it, he said, there's something about, about completing, being able to communicate that makes it complete in me. You know, if I see a great movie, I got to tell you, you got to see that, you know, to, to share an experience, a good joke or a good book or something like that. There's something that when I am fellowshipping in that sense, there's something complete about that. Worship, God doesn't need it, but I think I need to worship him because it puts me in the right place. It makes me feel small, which is what I need to feel. I want to sense this awesomeness of God. When I stand in front of a mountain in Colorado, I just, there's a, there's a whole different sense in me. And it matters to me. And to complete that is okay. And his mercies are new every morning. Isn't there something new to praise him about every day? And God is perfect in how he can receive that where we're not. I can't explain it. And there's some things that will remain paradoxical. But here's the other thing. Um, going back to motivation, I think, is um, I'm not worshiping God because I have to. I hope you don't come here because you have to. I hope somebody didn't say, oh gosh, we gotta go to church to worship God today. Man, stay home. You are really not here 
for the right motivation. I mean, come and change, but I want to come because I get to worship God today. You know, we talk about baseball and uh, you are a good football player, but you loved baseball more. And so when you went to practice, you loved being there. Me too. I couldn't wait to get there. I hated it that the sun was going down and we couldn't play anymore. I hated that because I love baseball. I love to play. Everything about it, I loved. But inside of this game, there were drills that we were always doing. Feeling ground balls, taking fly balls, hitting balls. We were always doing something to produce muscle memory in us so that we could become better baseball players. But it was never a, oh, I gotta go to practice today. I loved going to practice. Football's a different story. I didn't want to go. I didn't like it nearly as well, but there was a guy on our team who would always say, you gotta love this. Oh, you got to love that. What he was saying is, I love this. I love football. I love to be here. And coach is going to ask us to do some things that might be difficult. But if you love it, wow, love to be here. And there's something about that to me that I love Jesus. I love what he's done. I'm motivated by that thought. Now, I think there is a secondary motivation that we probably should talk about. And, and that is the awesomeness of God the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I, I want to understand who he is, that I'm not his equal, that I'm not even, it's infinity against zero. He's so much bigger than I am. And so I want to put myself in a place where I understand who he is. Matt Chandler uh, gave a talk about a, a retreat that he went to with his family. And, um, and part of the retreat was this petting zoo and on this in this petting zoo there were um, fainting goats you guys know what a fainting goat is which is really an argument against evolution how does a fainting goat ever anyway sorry well I digress but anyway anytime you would like rush a goat like this they'd freeze up and faint and pass out and so as these guys are walking through the guy that's leading the retreat he said now listen here's the rule okay don't mess with the fainting goats, okay? Because they're just going to faint. Don't mess with them. And all the guys are looking at each other going, you know what we're going to do all week, don't you? We're going to mess with the fainting goats. And, um, and Matt said, the only reason we wanted to mess with those fainting goats is because they were fainting goats. If it was a different animal, we would not have treated them that way. If it was a pit bull, we're not rushing a pit bull. If it were a lion, we're not rushing the lion. We have a proper respect for a lion. And I think we should have a, a proper respect and a fear of God. I knew my dad could destroy me. I wasn't afraid of him in the sense that I didn't want to get near him because he might. I knew he loved me. But there was a certain respect that I had. Ecclesiastes says, guard your steps when you enter into the house of God. It's like electricity. You know, I don't fear electricity. Thank God for electricity right now. It brings light. It brings warmth. We are, you know, under its influence to a certain degree. But a live wire, we would run away from that. There's something powerful about that that I have to have a proper respect for. And so I think there's a bit of a secondary, you know, motivation behind that. And um, a lot of conversations that move towards God move towards his loving nature, which is perfect, but they, they move away from his holiness, his awesomeness, his sinlessness, his, the fact that I will give an account to him. And, and I'm okay with that. You know, Isaiah, when he saw the Lord, he said, woe is me. There was something there that began that, but then there was this beautiful redemption that came when the angel came and put the coals on his mouth and cleansed him from that sin. So, um, you know, I don't know what brings me to my right motive. I don't know if it's the, the fear of God that brings me to a love of God or love of God, fear of God. I don't know. I know they need to be in their proper space. And, um, and I think that's a good thing. I want, I want to be uh, where I am. I know that I am not God and he is worthy of my praise. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, and, and it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Which is amazing, right? isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there's, it, is, it is a right view of who God is. Yeah. Um, 
as we see him for all of his attributes and characteristics that we see throughout Scripture. Uh, one more question kind of in, in, in that, and then I've got a couple texts that I want to try to address. We talked about baseball and the discipline and the, the effort that we put in, in and that we loved it. Yeah. What are, practically speaking, and I can answer this too, but what, what are those for you mm. in, in your spiritual walk? Worship. What do you mean? Fel uh, worship. Um, singing to God. Okay. I know that's, it's, it's broader than that, but for me, okay. when I really, I, I connect with the Lord through worship. I think you read the Psalms and you see that's, that's absolutely the case. When you look at heaven, the angel, there are angels that are, their whole, their whole job is to say, holy, 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 to stand in the presence of God. And they don't get bored by that. That's what they do. And there's something about being in his presence through song that really moves me. Um, prayer, fellowship with other believers is huge. Uh, serving him, finding a place to use my gifts, uh, those are all disciplines. Opening the scriptures and reading them and really studying them and seeing what it says. That, because it changes my affections. It just does. It's like we were talking about not being uh, conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our minds. How do I renew my mind? It's what I'm thinking about when I'm singing a song about the attributes of God or I'm talking to a friend about um, you know, sharpening one another or I'm praying to him. I'm in his throne room and I'm speaking to him. I'm listening to him in his word. If I'm filling myself at that point, then there are all of my perspectives change. If I'm not then all I have is a worldly perspective and it seems God is dull and distant and why would I want any part of that? Because the world speaks a lot louder to me than he does. What about dealing with sin? I mean, you know, the, the Christian life uh, is, a, is a walk and, and a hope that sin has less and less of a hold on us. Mm -hmm. So what are the, what's the, what's the effort and the resting working together in dealing with your, your sin. Don't you want to answer that? I would love to answer that. <laughs> Why don't you start and I'll okay. finish. Okay. Well, I, I guess the beef I have, and I, I know I always have beefs here, um, <laughs> but I don't, think, I don't think Jesus came and died on the cross and rose again and went to heaven and seated with God in order to give us another list of rules. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, this comes from my experience of when I, when I became a Christian, I just thought it was, okay, well, here are all the right rules that you're supposed to follow. And, and so, um, because typically what I find happens is the more that I try to work on my sin, the more the sin mm -hmm. has a hold on me. Mm -hmm. It has my attention. I'm more conscious mm -hmm. of my sin than I am about the truth of who I am in Christ. Yeah. And so to me, rather than trying to work hard on my sin, it's kind of like, okay, the, the old man is dead, that my, my sin is dead. It's, it's, and, and yet, for some reason, I want to pick it back up and kill it again, hmm. and pick it back up and kill it again, rather than let it lay dead and say, that no longer has reign in my mm, life, yeah. even though I experience that it kind of does. But that passage, see, I mean, I think when I, it's Romans 8. <laughs> where it talks about mortifying the flesh. Mm -hmm. As I understand that passage, when I look at the Greek, see if I can remember again, it is a present imperative and it's uh, active. It's a present active imperative, which means you do it over and over and over again. There's no... I killed the flesh and it's no longer alive in me. I, 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 I know it's dead, but it has to be deader than it is currently. And Romans 7, when we talk about Romans 7, uh, oh, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? That's the apostle Paul, the most godly man who's probably ever lived. He is saying, I'm chained to a dead man. I mean, you've heard me long enough to know that when I talk about that passage, the, there is a, uh, 
a, a, a capital punishment in Paul's day, if you're guilty of murder, it may be that you would be chained hand to hand and foot to foot to a dead body. That was your capital punishment for killing. And every day, every step you're taking with this dead body, is it dead? Yes. You still carry it. And is it infecting you? I mean, that's how the guy died, was to be infected by a dead body. Ugh, what a way to go. That's why he said, who will rescue me from this body of death? Answer, well, I'll read it. Thanks okay. be to God through Jesus, <laughs> Jesus Christ, Christ, our Lord. There's something, it's still there though. And I don't know that anybody would argue that. And but, I don't think, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. <laughs> when we're talking about thinking about the dead guy all the time, uh, Rick Warren in his book, Purpose Driven Life, um, I think he was quoting Oscar Wilde when Oscar Wilde said, I can resist anything but temptation. <laughs> it's a great, well, I thought that was funnier than you did, obviously. I thought that's very funny. I can really resist anything but temptation. And Rick Warren was talking about when you're tempted, what should you do? And you mentioned it. Do I focus on what I'm being tempted by? No. If I'm tempted to look at a woman with lust, if I'm tempted to eat that cheesecake that I know I shouldn't, then I can't think about that. I have to put my mind somewhere else. That's where since you have been raised with Christ, set your affections on things that are above. You know, renew your mind. It's all about thinking in another direction to me. And then, even though I'm still chained to that dead man, and I always will be until I'm glorified, until I'm finally set free, that that dead man will not have um, mastery over me. But what do we do then with Romans 6, 18? You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Mm -hmm. See, like, I, I just can't either, I mean, I know, I know that the old man's dead. I know, and I also know that there are still sin in our members in mm -hmm. Romans 7, okay? Mm -hmm. That, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Yeah. There's, yes, there has to be something that is still in us, this side of heaven, that is still laden with sin. And, I mean, as, as I've understood it, it's, it's, in, it's in your habitual sin. Mm -hmm. It's in some of the memories of your past mm -hmm. that that sin lives. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I can see carrying that along. But yet, when I look all over, I mean, there's so much about count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, that... He forgave all of our sins. God made you alive with Christ. He set your heart on things above. Your mind's not on earthly things. You died. Your life's now hidden. All those things that say that. And so either it's, it's either dead or it's not. And either I'm slave to it or I'm not. And what do I do with it if I know that there is some power that it has, and there's an enemy at work, and there is mm. evil in this world, and it's a dark place, and I, but rejoice in all circumstances, and we are able to have uh, the mind of Christ, and we are able to have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, of goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, the fruit of the Spirit, and all these things that say there is something available for us as Christians, and yet oh, I just can't get over this sin. This thing keeps beating me up. I'm never going to get over this. I'm just going to have to fight harder and work more at getting over this. And I guess I just don't know. I, I want to abide and rest. Mm -hmm. And I want something to do as well. <laughs> have you ever asked somebody, do you know, do you know somebody who you feel like has maybe, I mean, arrived spiritually? I know some very great, strong Christians, but nobody's uh, I know, and have you, have you then asked them? Of what they do? Uh, no, uh, or about, have what? they, have they, have they, uh, do they have final victory? Have you ever asked them that? I know that people have had final victory in some things. But not everything. Not everything. Well, okay, so Donna Boss, I love you. Uh oh. I remember one time, I'm sorry. <laughs> really, we should bring her up here, right? <laughs> I remember asking Donna, because I think she's about the most godly woman I know. 
And um, now don't get prideful because that's a sin, okay? <laughs> but I asked Donna one night before prayer meeting, I said, Donna, do, do you still struggle with sin? <laughs> and you know what she said? Yes. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? And so, I mean, I know it's true, but, and yet, I'm sorry, Donna, you'll probably leave the church, but I hope not. But, but there, there is something about when I look at her, I see a woman abiding in Christ. And still, you know, it is this walking in fellowship with Jesus. I don't see her striving, trying hard. You know, it's, it's her walk with Jesus. And that's the key. It's, again, like you said, I think it's brilliant that you said that, that Jesus isn't out there and we're trying to get closer to him. It's that he's right here and we're walking with him. That's, that's the key to me. What were some questions? Yeah, that yeah there's a good question. So do you think it's harder for men to get it because society tells them to be strong and therefore unemotional? So I think the question is um, this whole idea of, of rest and um, that we respond and, and, and get the love of Christ that's like, well, I don't know that I really need that because I'm able to do this on my own. Just kind of as a strong man who's supposed to be able to handle these things. Um, is it harder for a guy? Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I mean, if, I, honestly, if I look at the faces of Christian men that I know, I think it absolutely is. Is easier? It's harder. Yeah, I think so too. I, I, I mean, just because there's, there is this sense that as a man, you're not supposed to, well, first of all, show emotion, I, I guess. I don't know if that's really as true anymore. Um, but to, to say that if you were to see Christ truly for who he is, to know what he did, and that I don't respond emotional doesn't mean that you don't get it, mm -hmm. right? We, mm -hmm. We've talked about mm -hmm. that. But at the same point, there needs to be a surrender. There needs to be a letting go. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, in my experience, I don't really try too hard with guys who think they got it together. Mm -hmm. I really yeah. don't. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, I, I feel like um, I, I could chase them and work really hard at, at making them get it. I don't think that's my job, though. It, it, in my experience, the guys who have come to me broken, who needed something, like they, they ran out. Yeah. They are the ones that are ready. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I asked the question, like, do you have to be broken at some point? I just don't think anybody ever admits that they've arrived. I think that's, I can fool people, but I don't, I, I, I don't think so. I think the guys that say they've arrived are so far from that. Because they're not honest. And, and you know, they, they may do their acts of righteousness in front of men and try to convince you that I've got this all taken care of. But Jesus says it's, you're dead men. You, you know, you're full of dead men's bones. You wash the outside of the tomb and you look great and you fool people, but you're not fooling anybody. You're not fooling God. And that's the one, that's the one that matters to me. And, you know, if, if the Apostle Paul, if he can... Right, Romans 6, 7, and 8. And it seems very paradoxical in everything he said, and he's the one that said it all, that I'm, I'm comfortable with allowing it to still remain a bit of a mystery, that I know who I am in Christ, I know I haven't arrived, that I do see through a glass dimly. My, 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 my eyes have been unveiled, I see the truth, but I still don't see perfectly and I can't until I see him face to face I don't know if that makes yeah. any sense so when somebody let's just if somebody comes to Christ they walk, they walk into this church or into your office and they say I just accepted Christ what's the next thing hmm. what happens next because I think that's kind of what we're talking about here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you tell somebody no, not me, somebody else. Uh, you involve yourself here. Now, I don't want to give them a list because that's... But there are things they, they have to do. Course, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what? 
Because I think the list, the, the tendency of the church is to take somebody who became a Christian and give them all the things they're supposed to do as a good Christian now, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, we I give mean, isn't them, that, because, of course, we because that's f- controllable. Like, I can, I can help somebody, okay, you become a Christian, great. Well, here are all the things that a good Christian does, so now go do that. Well, it's better than the alternative. Is it? Yes. Like what? Giving them nothing. Well. I mean, hey, good, you got born. Good luck with that. Here's a steak. <laughs> Okay, you gave him a steak. No, I d- wouldn't give him a You wouldn't steak. give him a steak. No. Well, you just said you did. I know, but that's what it's like saying. Oh, okay. It's okay, you need milk. And but see, I would that, say... Ah, then that's but, it. No, that's it. Paul even said it. Peter's Peter. Peter. You know, that he, he was angry with the, the guys he's writing to because, you know, you guys are just drinking milk. You should be on your way to meat. But that's because they had, they'd had a sense of growth. But he didn't start them there. And I don't think we can say, okay, now you need to go to seminary because you've just trusted Jesus. They would be overwhelmed by that. It's like math. You learn one plus one equals two before you do trigonometry. So what's the one plus one? What's the, what's the most important thing for somebody when they come to Christ that they need to delve into? <sighs> this may, I think, accountability. I think... Let's get together. Let's fellowship together. Let me help you. You almost become, you know, that, that mother who's nursing. I think they need somebody to walk with them through that, to show them somebody that's a little bit further along. And that person can give them, you know, tools and feed them. And, and, and hopefully that over time they will be able to feed themselves. But I think it starts really slow. I think it starts incrementally. Can I, can I change that word? Sure. In, instead of accountability relationship? Well, yeah. Well, I mean, cause, yeah. and the reason I say that is because accountability to me means you are making sure I don't do bad things. That's what accountability conjures up for me. To you? Yeah. Really? Okay. So, so, so for me, if you're my accountability partner, what you're doing is you're calling me out on my junk. Really? Yeah. I, I think that's part of it. Okay. But yeah. well, that's, that, again, that's this get. is perspective. Yeah. Okay. Mine's like, we get to hang out together. <laughs> <laughs> which is fun is that? Which is great. And I think yeah. that's important. Mm-hmm. But I, I guess to me, yes, the relationship yeah. is key. But isn't the relationship to... Because I think it is prayer and scripture, yeah. but it's not in the sense of, well, now you need to know all these things. No. You need to know Jesus, yeah. like know him more deeply. Mm-hmm. And so that's the abiding, mm-hmm. you know, that's the living with Christ in that, okay, let's, let's learn together who he is. Mm-hmm. Let's learn who you are now. Mm-hmm. Like that's, man, I, I wish, because, I wish I would have got that. Well, but you needed somebody that knew that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, and that's. Where we just can't leave them in the incubator. We just, we have to, I think there has to be somebody, you know, Paul said to the church, follow me as I follow Christ. Find somebody that's following Christ. I mean, that is really paramount. And then there are disciplines that I think you can introduce. There's books of disciplines of a godly man. I mean, you can find 15 disciplines to do and that's good. And it should be but it, 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 it can't be motivated by guilt. It's, you understand the gospel. Thank you. I think that, you keep preaching good. the gospel to yourself. Thank you. I, I, not motivated by guilt is no. such a... And, and on a daily I, basis, in the, in the living the life of a Christian, guilt and condemnation and shame, I don't think, are, a, are, are daily experiences. No. No. Isn't it? They will never get you where you need to be. That's religion. That's, that's what religion teaches. Don't do this and do that and you'll be good. I mean, how dumb do you think God is? I mean, I know guys that as long as they, you know, do this, they can live any way they want. That is so ridiculous. That's antinomianism that says God's grace is free, so shouldn't we sin more, more so that abounds. grace abounds more? And Paul said, God forbid that you should do that. How dare you even say that? You don't understand grace if that's what you're into. But when I understand grace that Jesus died on a cross for my sins, all of my sins, past, present, and future, were put on him, the wrath of God was satisfied on him, that I get my sins forgiven, adopted into the family, heaven is my home. When I understand that, and I continue to learn about that, Mm -hmm. 
I've been a Christian for 33 years and I'm just, I think, tapping into the grace of God. Right? I mean, isn't it something that is a well that is continual? It's huge? I think so. I, I, that's my experience lately. I mean, it's just been understanding it more and more. And not just here, but really yeah, yeah. really making that 18-inch journey. Mm -hmm. um, and I, that's exciting to me to know that there's more uh, yeah, that's available. Mm -hmm. um, that it's not just a bunch of things to do. Yeah. Um, but it, I guess it's just, it's so counter, the whole idea of resting and abiding in Christ is so counter to what probably as Westerners we know. <laughs> um, but I, boy, it sure is. I mean, the culture the, or the kingdom is, is really countercultural. And so anytime we are trying to do things like our culture does and expecting God results, um, I think we're, we're, we're in for a, uh, it's not going to satisfy. Mm -hmm. It's not going to meet the expectations of what we think it will. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I love the conversation that we, we have in this. Mm -hmm. I think there's, I think for both of us, the past experience certainly makes a difference in the way that we mm -hmm. approach this. Mm -hmm. um, I just want, I, I guess one of our hopes in this was that it got you guys thinking a little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah. You know, there's, there are a lot of scriptures, and we included some of them that are in your notes, but there are a lot more that we've been looking at and want to encourage you all to look at on your own um, to press through this, you know? And, yeah. and maybe this has struck a chord for some of you. Um, next week, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more on some other things, but yeah. I, I think this is a really interesting conversation. Well, let me put a bow on it, all right? Let's try to finish this thought. So Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We know that to be true. We understand grace is free. But Jesus also said this. He said, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate that leads and the, and the road that leads to destruction. Uh, the word narrow literally is stenos. It's where we get the word sten a st a st stencil. A stenographer's pen that's very narrow and thin. There is one way, and that is through Jesus Christ. So we understand that the, the entry into relationship with God is through Jesus Christ and Him alone. And when we enter into that relationship with Him, then He says, the road is narrow. In fact, this is what it says. The gate is narrow. The way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. The word hard in the Greek language, it literally means like pressing down, agonizingly difficult. The road is hard and filled with trouble and pressure and difficulties. And Jesus is saying to you and me, get on that road. That is the road. Now, some of us, when we see that, this is the picture that we get in our mind. That's a narrow road. It's, you know, quiet and lonely. And, but there's something kind of cool about that. You know, a Kansas gravel road. Oh, yeah, that's nice. But I think Jesus meant something like this. <laughs> I think that's what he's talking about. The road is narrow, and treacherous and dangerous and it has highs and it has lows and moments you're 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 climbing and you're you're striving and, and it's hard because you're going uphill and the next minute you're going downhill and you're thinking oh, the brakes better not fail or I'm gonna die and there's you know curves and cliffs and it the road takes us into enemy territory the road takes us through different storms and heat and rain and, and, and winter blizzards. And it's, it's, it's a difficult, difficult road. But this road leads us to the celestial city. That's Bunyan's words. To heaven. It leads there. You're on that road. It's leading there. But the difficulty is real. It absolutely is. And anybody that would say something else, I think, is selling you a bit of goods that are no good. And then Paul follows this up by saying, 
Um, he says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, that there's some sort of an effort. So, so Jesus puts us on the narrow road. Paul piles on by saying, work it out, <laughs> work hard. Come on, you can do this. But then he finishes by saying this, and I think this is the point. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Is there effort in the Christian life? Of course there is. Is it hard? Yes. Is it daunting? Of course it is. Do you want to quit sometimes? Yeah. But you're not alone. That's the difference. Jesus isn't out there. He's right here and we walk hand in hand through the narrow road, over and under and through. I've been reading two books kind of simultaneously and I just finished um, one called Silence. Um, there was a movie, uh, I haven't seen the movie yet, but I read the book and, and basically the, the premise of Silence is Catholic priests that are going into Japan from Portugal uh, and so to make a long story short, um, it's a really good read. It's a tragic ending. But this, this one particular Catholic priest was taken captive and um, they wanted him to apostatize. All you have to do to apostatize is a step on an image of Jesus. They called it the Fumi or Fumji. All you have to do is step on the image and you're good to go. You don't have to, you know, you're fine. You're, you, you, we're not going to kill you. We're not going to torture you. We're not going to, you know, pour hot water on you. We're not going to put you in a pit. We're not going to do anything else. And he wouldn't do it throughout the whole movie or the whole book. He wouldn't do it. One night he's, um, he's in his cell and he hears this noise and he thinks that it's the guard who's snoring. And the snoring is so bothersome to him that he finally just starts beating on the walls and the interpreter comes in and says, what is wrong? And he says, shut this guy up, he's snoring. And the guy says, he's not snoring. That's not the guy snoring. No, that's people who are groaning. They're suffering. They're in a pit. They're tied by their feet, hung upside down because you won't apostatize. They're suffering because of you. And he said, have they not apostatized? He said, no, they have. They've already denied the faith and they're still suffering because of you. All you have to do is step on the image and they'll go free. Talk about pressure, right? But all throughout the movie, he feels all alone. The reason it's called silence is because he doesn't hear from God. And as I understand that theology, I don't know that he had God in his heart. I think he was working towards him and there was, this, there was no relationship. It was just, I've got to do, I've got to do, I've got to do. And finally, he steps on the image. And, and, and the book ends the last few pages of him after he steps on the image. And he's completely defeated. And there's no hope. And it's a terrible ending because there's no redemption for this guy. He just failed. And because he failed, he's done for. He lost his faith. It's over for him. There's no hope. The other book I'm reading is given to me by Jerry Luthi. Some of you guys will remember Mike Torpy. You guys remember, anybody remember Mike Torpy? Torpy was a... Um, a guy that when I was here, he was an old man and um, died shortly after I got here. But Torpy fought in World War II. And I think he, he fought in the Pacific coast. And I, I, I think he fought on Peleliu, but I think he also was maybe in Iwo Jima. And I remember Mike talking to me about, you know, he was, the guy on his left and the guy on his right both got killed and here he is still alive. But he was going, uh, he went through all that and survived. And Jerry wanted me to read kind of, you know, the experience of those soldiers going through Peleliu. And so I'm reading this book and these soldiers going through this awful, awful, hot, dry, thirsty, terrified, being shot at, mortars blowing up, watching their buddies be decimated by bullets. Um, they're, they're, they're just, they're in agony. They're in this swamp and they're in this foxhole and they stink and they don't know if they're gonna be alive tomorrow and they're, they're, they're just suffering greatly. But they're not alone. And there's something beautiful about what's going on in that foxhole. 
These guys can do it because they're together. And if you've ever talked to a guy that's been in battle, there is a fellowship there that is deeper than anything, maybe even marriage. I mean, they've talked about how those guys will never forget it. We went through this together. And there is, a, there is an intimacy to that relationship because of going through it together. And you've heard him say, you know, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't give you a dime to be able to experience that again, but I wouldn't take a million dollars for the experience. And as I'm reading those two books, this kind of thought come to my mind that there are some people that I think they strive so hard, but they're doing it alone. And, and, and how empty that must be. And Jesus says to us, the road is hard and narrow and dangerous, but you're not walking alone in it. I walk with you through that. And I don't know, that just simplifies it for me that I know I'm with him, he's with me, so I can rest in who I am in Christ and I can walk with him because where he leads, I'll follow. And I, I'm a simple guy and I think that helps me immensely. So whatever we can do to maintain and build intimacy with Christ, that's where our effort ah, yes. would oh, lie. Can I read? <laughs> John Piper wrote this, I love it. He said, the war is to rest in the right place. The whole world is telling you to rest in all the wrong places. Rest in money. Rest in success. Rest in your strength. Rest in your ability. Rest in your youth. Rest in your business. Rest in your popularity. The world wants you to find your rest and your peace in these things. Insurance, padlocks, retirement portfolios, and the war is to rest in the right place. And it just happens to be hard to rest for Christians who are worldly. <laughs> it's a good thought. Well, I think we're out of time. And I think we've confused all of these lovely people. <laughs> Maybe. Shall we pray together and then we will... Um, close with worship. If you need to talk to us, we'll, we'll continue to talk. I mean, we're still working it out, but Lord, thank you for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you that you've rescued us from our sin and you've called us into something that's really difficult. I mean, to work out your salvation, but it's a beautiful thing that we've been given a gold mine that we can work out. And you said that you will work with us. Your will will be done in our life. And so, uh, help us to at least see that even though it's a bit paradoxical, then I think there's an answer. And I pray that it is uh, clear today that you loved us so much that you rescued us and you just now want us to walk with you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you guys stand with us as we sing this last song together? Hey!